seven o'clock, so let's get started. Um, welcome to the Vashon Heritage Museum Museum Talks. Tonight's presentation is an interview uh, format in partnership with the Vashon Nature Center. And this is a reminder that your microphone is muted for this talk. You'll see the speakers and not others. If you have a question, please type it into the chat function and we will answer those questions um, throughout the interview, but probably mostly at the end of the interview. I'd like to recognize and thank For Culture for sponsoring this uh, museum talk series. I'm Elsa Kroonquist. I'm the executive director of the Heritage Museum. And as is our tradition, we respectfully uh, recognize and acknowledge the native people. So I'd like to introduce at this time, Chris Austin, who is a Vashon Heritage Museum board member and co-producer of our talk series to read our land acknowledgement statement. <clears throat> well, thank you, Elsa. We get that here for you. All right, we acknowledge and recognize that we are on the ancestral lands and traditional homes of the Schwabops Coast Salish native people, the first people of Vashon Island. This land was their home long before Euro-American voyagers and settlers came. They were forcibly removed from these lands and relocated onto neighboring reservations, including Puyallup, Nisqually, Squaxin Island, and Muckleshoot. Vashon Island is their traditional home and their historical relationship with the land continues today. We honor the island itself and the Chobops people, past and present. Thank you, Chris. And now the Vashon Heritage Museum Inclusion Pledge. Vashon Mori Island Heritage Museum rejects racism, discrimination, and hate. Our purpose is to honor stories of love, oppression, action, and resilience. Stories that give voice to all, examine hard questions about social, economic, and environmental justice, and reveal racism and oppression within our heritage. We pledge that everything we do will honor the island's diversity of cultures and history. Um, we'd like to invite you to join us in November as we recognize Veterans Day with Vashon historian Bruce Holman and special guest who will present uh, Vashon veterans from the Civil War to Afghanistan. Um, then we're going to be taking a break in December, and then please join us the second Thursday in January 2022 as we kick off a new series of museum talks. In November, we'll open our new exhibit. The next slide, please, Chris. We'll open our new exhibit in partnership with Vashon Nature Center, Natural Wonder, an Island Shaped by Water. Join us starting in November and we'll be running uh, for two years with that new exhibit. And now I'd like to introduce our interviewer for tonight's discussion. Bianca Perla is the founder and director of Vashon Nature Center. She has a PhD in ecology from University of Washington and MS in animal behavior from Northern Arizona University and a BS in birth systems from Stanford University. For the past 25 years, Bianca has enjoyed working as a wildlife biologist in remote wilderness areas from Grand Canyon, Arizona to the rivers of River of No Return Wilderness, Idaho. She has worked she has also worked as an environmental educator in Yosemite National Park. Her passion for nature was sparked as a child with license to roam the forests, beaches, and creeks of Vashon. We are very happy to have Bianca back on the island, raising her family and doing work she loves in a community that she holds dear. Welcome, Bianca, and will you introduce tonight's guest? Sure, thanks, Elsa. I'm excited for this talk tonight or this interview. Um, and I'm honored to introduce David B. Williams, who is the author. Uh, he's an author and naturalist, a tour guide, and a Seattle local whose new book, Home Waters, A Human and Natural History of Puget Sound, 
um, is what we're going to be talking about tonight. It's a deep exploration of the stories of uh, this beautiful waterway that we're right in the middle of on Vashon. And um, he's also the author of the award-winning book, Too High and Too Steep, Reshaping Seattle's Topography, as well as Seattle Walks, Discovering History and Nature in the City, and Stories in Stone, Travels Through Urban Geology, where he tells you all about um, where all the stones in the buildings of Seattle come from. So that's pretty exciting too. Williams is a curatorial associate at the Burke Museum, and you can follow him on Twitter at Geology Writer. Welcome, David. Oh, thank you. It is a pleasure to be here, Bianca. And I, of course, like to thank Elsa and Chris for all of their work. And certainly want to thank you all for uh, your very thoughtful and respectful acknowledgments and pledge. Um, to me, that is, I think, really embodies the spirit of the connections to place. And that's one of the things that I'm really pleased about being able to work with both the Nature Center and with the museum is that passion that you all bring for understanding and connecting uh, people to this landscape. Great. So thank you. Thanks, David. Well, um, I would love it. You were saying that you had a little bit of your book that you'd like to read to start us off. Yeah. Um, but I would love to hear what you picked. Okay, great. So um, in the summer of 2018, I grieved with millions of people around the world our collective sadness focused on a 20-year-old mother, Tilakwa, one of a dwindling number of orca who regularly visit Puget Sound. On July 24, Tilakwa had given birth to her second child, a daughter who died within 20 minutes. For the next 17 days, she carried the six-foot-long body of her dead offspring on a journey of more than 1,000 miles. Finally, Tilakwa let her calf go. Our hearts broke. Then two years later, on September 6, 2020, it was with much joy that whale researchers announced Tilakwa had given birth two days earlier. The healthy and precocious boy, chat, boy calf, dubbed J57, was born in the Strait of Juan de Fuca after an 18-month gestation. To paraphrase Emily Dickinson, hope is a baby orca in Puget Sound. Mourning the loss of a child is a natural Response for humans and orca, both species are smart, self-aware, and deeply connected to their families. Clearly, Tilakwa, like us, had loved her child daughter and did not want to part from her. And as we learned, her extended family tried to help by providing food for the grieving mother. Ecologists suggested that they might also have been mourning with her. Tilakwa and her family are members of a group of more than 70 orca known as the Southern Resident Killer Whales. These animals, which have evolved a culture and community unique to their home in Puget Sound, travel together, hunt together, and communicate using their own distinctive dialect. Solidifying their cultural affinity, the Southern residents also rely on the collective knowledge of their elders, particularly the matriarchs, who act as guides and teachers to their family members. Why shouldn't they also love and grieve together? And why should we also love and grieve with Tilakwa. Few animals are sacred and iconic to Puget Sound, residents as orca, or in more dire straits. Habitat loss, disturbance from noise and boat traffic, exposure to an ever-increasing toxic mixture of pollutants, and overfishing of their favorite food, salmon, have pushed the southern resident population to the point where their very survival in Puget Sound is in doubt. For many who followed Tilakwa, their grief for her was compounded by their grief for the environment of Puget Sound and the way its degradation affects orca and humans. If Tilakwa and her calf couldn't thrive, what did it mean for us? More than any other story, Tilakwa's loss crystallized the central environmental challenges of Puget Sound. The orca are suffering, the salmon are suffering, we are responsible. For most of my life, I've lived within a few miles of Puget Sound. I knew that I lived by troubled waters, but I had not fully grasped the magnitude of that crisis that had been rising around me, like the tide submerging a low island. Although I saw myself as someone deeply aware of my natural surroundings, I realized I simply hadn't paid close enough attention to a place I loved and where I intend to reside for the rest of my life. I needed to take heed of all the people who have lived here, how they have related to the landscape over the millennia, and how their stories could provide a better understanding of the conditions 
now shaping the lives of modern residents. Furthermore, as a writer who is generally focused on stories about the land, I had not fully appreciated the water and those who dwell in it. Standing on the shoreline or riding a ferry and seeing only the surface of the water, which tends to appear untainted and beautiful, I had long failed to see the interconnected lives of the plants and animals beneath and to understand how they sustain and breathe life, both metaphorically and literally in Puget Sound. The effects of human activity, overfishing, pollution, and climate change reach deep beneath the surface. Our actions, their lives, our lives. We cannot cut one strand without unraveling the many connections that link us. This book then is my way to rectify my lack of understanding of the cultural and ecological history of my home waters and to provide a resource for others. The more of us who know and care about this place, the more momentum we can build to change our ways. We have reached a critical confluence for the waters of Puget Sound. Paraphrasing Wallace Stegner, is this a native home of hope where we can create a society to match its scenery, or will we succumb to baser values? Since I began writing Home Wars, my own enhanced appreciation and understanding of Puget Sound's incredible beauty, diversity, and potential for recovery have led me to believe that the most valuable assets of Puget Sound are not the resources we have long extracted, but the relationships that residents can make with this place. Learning from the past is central to forging and nurturing those relationships and to creating a positive future for Puget Sound and all its inhabitants. By taking this journey, I feel I gained an extra dimension of sight. Now, when I look out over the surface of the sound, I can see deep into its history and, and the peopling of the landscape, its residents' travels by canoe, steamer, and ferry, their endeavors to carve out a living, and their fears of invaders. I can see deep underwater to lush forests of exquisite beauty and complexity to corpulent clams that can outlive people, and to fish whose annual spawning creates a spasm of desire attracting uncountable numbers. I can also see into a future where I have hope. If the residents of Puget Sound hold this place to be special and unique, as I think we do, then we will recognize our responsibilities, not only to this generation, but to the generations to come, human and more than human. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, David. Lovely writing. I love you. how you speak about those relationships to place and to each other. And, and hopefully we'll delve into that a little bit yeah. in the interview today. Um, and I love that, that image of, of the water and then looking below the surface. And so there are so many stories, there's so many stories in your book. And so hopefully we'll, we'll hit on a few of those um, today, but but we're only going to scratch the surface, folks. He's got a lot of <laughs> a lot of stories and richness in the book. I, I just wanted to start out because I'm always curious when I read people who write about nature or are in nature careers. How did your passion for the natural world begin? Yeah, that's a great great question, and and I'm particularly coming from you, since it seems like we've had some parallel mm -hmm. careers and connections to place and landscape, and and certainly to education. Um, curiously, I, when I went to college, I wasn't planning on being a natural history major. Um, I took a physics class and I got a 16% on a quiz. And I realized, you know, maybe I'm just not cut out for that. But I had taken intro to geology and I realized I really liked being out there. I spent a lot of time hiking as a kid. But it was really in college when I decided to major in field trips, what some people call geology, I call field trips. That really sort of catalyzed it. But then after college, I was lucky enough to end up in Southern Utah working for a nonprofit field school, like say like the North Cascades Institute or someplace like that. And I was outside all the time and I was learning the stories of place from the experts and really became inundated and saturated with that passion that they had, the way they saw connections between people and landscape, between plants and animals, between all of those different components of the natural world. And it was just being out there really living it and breathing it all the time that, that, that really fostered and, and grew it. And then when I moved back to Seattle about 20 plus years ago, I knew I had that passion with me and I realized more and more being in an urban environment where it wasn't 
this sort of like living in Moab where I was five minutes from incredible beauty that I really had to push and dive deeper and, and, and that those connections to, to the natural world are really what keep me happy. So it was a combination of things, of living in very wild place and then moving back to a very urban place and realizing that my core of who I am is still through that, that the relationships that I, I experience in the natural world. Wow, oh, that's great. I resonate with that because that happened with me a little bit. Once you, you return to a more urban area, it's, it's those little things that start popping out and becoming yeah. interesting, you know, instead of the big wild landscapes. And that's a whole new love. Yeah, very, yeah. very neat. Okay, well, since you are a geologist or a, a major in field trips, <laughs> 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 I'm going to give you a sort of geology question first. Um, and, it, and it's, it's about when you were talking about the end of the last glaciation. And you describe this period of extreme upheaval and ecological change and unpredictability where the land was experiencing that isostatic rebound where it's literally rising up from being pressed down from the glaciers and it's happening fairly rapidly and there's still vo volcanoes and during that time people are living here they're starting to you know they're inhabiting this place and um, this dynamic environment and so when I think about our age now and the fast changes that are happening in the environment um, as we face today's climate crisis, what lessons can we take from the first peoples that, that lived in this dynamic, geologically volatile time and what's similar and what's, what's different? Yeah, interesting. I think several things. One, um, from what I've gathered from reading and, and, and I think trying to understand some of the stories of the indigenous people here. It's, an, it's the adaptations that were made were based on observation. That, the, that was by living in that landscape that people had to, they had to adapt. But they're, the way that these adapt, adaptations play out, we've seen in areas where the archeological record shows that those adaptations are really based, are, are sort of responsive but also they're based on deep knowledge. They're not just doing things. They're seeing how the land has moved over time. How is it, how it has risen, how have tides changed, how have animal, how do animals move differently through the landscape than they used to? How have animals that we used to rely on moved out? For example, you know, after the, the last um, retreat of the glaciers, and this was a much more open landscape, more savanna-like around here. Those animals were, you know, big ungulates, um, and that were sort of, you know, down through the after the loss of the sort of big animals. Mm -hmm. But then it changes to a diet that becomes more fish-based. So people had to adapt, and they did it by paying attention and by having a relationship with place. And I think that's one thing that I came away from in working on this book was. The people who I spent mo the most time with being out in the field, biologists, and then trying to talk to a variety of different people, the people who had those deep relationships seem to have a, a grounding and a way of reacting to the, to the changes that are occurring in a way that was not sort of panicked and, and was reasoned and was based on science. Um, so I think that's, I think a big lesson is to be, to pay attention to what's going on around. And I think also the, one of the things that's really, I thought was really interesting was looking at the archeological record. There was a study done a few years back and they looked at how did indigenous people across the sort of region of the Coast Salish, how did they, how did their diets change over time? And they see once salmon become the sort of dominant animal about starting around 5,000 years ago, that they stay pretty consistent throughout, that there was a, again, that connection. And part of that connection was through that respect for the animals. And I think sometimes that's lost, um, this sort of reverence that I think we should have for these animals, these amazing lives, the amazing adaptations that they have made to place. How can we honor those in a more, uh, a responsible manner, I guess, is where, I guess that's what it comes down to. The, the lessons are responsibility, respect, and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And careful observation. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's nice. So, 
um, when you, one thing I liked about your book is that you, um, you do dive below the surface and talk about the stories of, of species that a lot of people don't touch on. I mean, your, your intro was about the orca whales and that's what a lot of people think of when they think of Puget Sound and um, salmon as well. Um, but there's two species in particular that you chose to highlight in your book that have a lot of significance on Vashon. And um, one of them is kelp and one of them is Pacific herring. And so I wanted to talk about those a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, maybe first herring, you call them the silver wave, which I love that, um, that image. Uh, well, we have a harbor called Quartermaster Harbor here on, on Vashon, mm -hmm. and that used to host the largest herring spawning grounds in South Central Puget Sound. Uh, but these stocks have declined steeply. And in fact, last year we recorded no, no herring spawning um, in Quartermaster. <clears throat> but in the past, you talk a little bit about what was found at the Jensen Archaeological Dig in terms of herring. and and um, could you tell that story a little bit and, and talk about the relationship of people to herring just through time, um, touch on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, the, you know, when, one of the aspects of why I did that, uh, Bianca, is that I was really interested in telling those stories of the overlooked mm -hmm. animals. And I think as you point out, and as I do in the introduction, you know, we, salmon and orca get so much attention and yet every, all the biologists you talk to, we need to take that bigger picture. And I think herring are certainly one of the centers of that story. As someone told, put it to me, they're the center around which this, the sound revolves by eating smaller things, converting it to nutrients, and then being eaten by larger animals. So they're real, they are just critically important to this area. And as you say, down in, in the South Sound, Quartermaster was a big area. Um, the archeological dig, down there, like many archeological digs in the region. Um, one thing that really stands out is the importance of herring for thousands of years. Um, I think that what, to me was one of a really, something I didn't, didn't know and certainly feel like was really a central thing to understand is that relationship between people and herring. They've, they've looked at archeological digs throughout the area and found just a very deep deep record of herring that they are always important to the indigenous people of this area. And they were an animal that has, I mean, there's so many interesting aspects about it, about them is that there's, they've, they're, as they begin, and this gets back to the, your sort of first question, one of the things that we're beginning to do with herring is better understand the science of herring. How do they how do their numbers change? What is important to their ecosystem? And as we better understand that, we are better able to understand the whole ecology of Puget Sound and the importance of looking at it from that holistic point of view. Um, but as you said, herring, you know, early, early on for an industry in this area was critical. Um, and then so many things have been, uh, how do I put it? Uh, you know, they were like so many animals that their populate, there was no consideration given for them in terms of exploitation. And we just see that throughout the sound, sadly, which I think we're learning from. And I think we are creating a more responsible way to, to live in the area. And um, it's, it's, again, it's that, it's a, there's, there's just this incredible connection. And by looking at those connections, we realize that we're all part of this big story here. As um, part of your research, you got to go out with scientists, right? That were, and did you ever go out with Tessa Francis? Cause she, yeah. she's, she studies Pacific herring and I know she was in your book a little bit. I fortunately didn't get to go out on. in the field with Tessa. I got to go yeah. uh, interview her in um, her office, which is, you know, okay. not that exciting, but um, <laughs> still, I mean, she's definitely one of the people who gave me really just great insights into um, the herring in the sound. I said, yeah, it was definitely one of the highlights of the book was being out in the field with people. I mean, I just got to do so many amazing things and see so many amazing, seeing the wildlife here and, and as they get beneath the surface. So tell us about one of your favorite field experiences while you were out there. I guess I've, I got a variety of ones. I mean, I've got some, you know, interesting ones. I was out with a group of biologists 
and uh, we were doing a near shore study and we weren't paying attention. The tide dropped and our boat got stuck <laughs> on a sandbar. Um, but which was, you know, which is great. I mean, it's like, you know, what, a, what better thing to have happen than you get stuck for three hours in Puget Sound waiting for the tide to rise. That was pretty cool. But probably the highlight was I went out with a Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, group that every year they do um, a survey across the sound, a bottom survey. They, they um, drop down a massive net to the bottom and then run it along the, sh the bottom for, for a short distance, pull everything up and then count every fish um, or whatever else, crab um, that they find in there. And then they, put every they toss everything back in. And just to see the incredible diversity was just stupendous for me. I mean, I, I think, again, as I said at the very beginning, I look out and we sort of see this blue surface, but then you realize, you know, there's the deepest spot is 900 feet deep in Puget Sound. In that volume, you can have an incredible array of diversity. And we do, and we were just pulling up little things, but we had something like 40, 40 plus species, you know, hundreds of individuals, um, all sorts of different sizes, shapes, colors, um, you know, these Dungeness crab, which, uh, you know, massive Dungeness crab, which can bite, which pinch through, I had thick rubber gloves on and they broke my, broke my skin. Um, so that, that was, happen. that was, that was, I, I wouldn't call that a fun part of it, but it was really <laughs> an interesting part, but yeah, just to be able to, to, to go out. And then I'll guess the other one I'll bring up, cause I just, I just love, love this. If I, if I may was, I was lucky enough to go out with, um, down into the South Sound with um, an area where they were doing um, gooey, working with gooey duck and, and commercial harvesting of, of gooey duck. And if you've never seen a baby gooey duck, you're missing out. Because we know how the big ones are just, we know, you know, they're just, <laughs> they're a unique animal. But the babies, oh my God, they are the cutest little animal because they, they're like the size of a little, uh, like a pinto bean. And they have that little neck that sticks out just like the big ones. And they wiggle it in the, in, in the water. They're really cute. So that was probably, yeah, I don't think I've seen anything that cute in a long time. <laughs> That's great. So they, they do have a redeemable part of their life history, huh? They do. They are, <laughs> gooey duck are totally, from an ecological point of view or their biology, life history is pretty neat. They're, yeah. they're really fascinating animals. So they, you know, they're, they're probably our second longest lived animal in the sound. The oldest one was 183 or 178 years, which is amazing to think. Yeah. Old growth. Old, old growth. growth. Yes. They are old growth. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about kelp for a little bit, because being in the, the south part of central Puget Sound, we've lost a lot of our kelp um, in the last, you know, 50 to 80 years. And um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the importance of kelp um, that people are, are realizing now, and then also touch on the, what you call the kelp highway. That was, that was really interesting to me. I hadn't heard about that before. Yeah, I'll start, I'll start the, in deeper, deeper time. So probably many people are familiar with the idea that um, people coming from Asia into North America, the, that migration 14, 15,000 years ago, maybe longer, some, some aspects of it, there, maybe longer, came through what was referred to as the ice-free corridor, um, basically came over the Bering Land Bridge and, and in Canada across on land. But in the last handful of years, um, archaeologists have been proposing a different idea of what they call the kelp highway. And so kelp, which in the sound, we have about 19 or 20 different species. Uh, it's a a group of plants that grow basically in fairly shallow water, always anchored to a hard substrate, so to a rocky substrate with a, an overstory of the giant kelp and the bull kelp. The bull kelp is probably the one most people are familiar with those. You find those long ropes on the shore with the big, uh, looks like a turkey baster on the end. And you have that overstory, then you also have an understory of, of plants. And the idea of the kelp highway is that people came out of Asia traveling by boat, didn't travel over land. They basically hugged the shore on that, following the kelp. 
and traveled along there, which it really makes sense. There's some, some advantages to that. One being is you don't have the really cold temperatures of the interior. Kelp forests act to attenuate wave action. So it would be a spot that probably the waves more calm area. It's an area with that kelp that you could actually tie, stay in the water and tie up to the kelp, up to those bull kelp. And this incredible diversity of plants, or excuse me, animals were using it. So you had food the whole way. So they're traveling by the kelp highway and one of the off ramps, if you will, would be uh, Puget Sound. And they traveled into Puget Sound that way as early as 13,000, maybe even a little bit longer ago than that. So, and that story of kelp remained, or the importance of kelp remained with indigenous people and continues to this day that as a central part of their cult, of, of Coast Salish culture is, the, is kelp used in a variety of ceremonies, but also used for food. You would maybe put kelp blades, those leaves down on your canoe to quiet the canoe down. You could put your paddle on them. Um, and so that's the, the deep sort of human history. And then the ecological history, we're all familiar with the terrestrial rainforest and the importance of the terrestrial rainforest. And particularly the idea, I think many people are, that the terrestrial rainforest grows on, is built on salmon. Salmon returning in their spawning, get eaten and excreted out, all those nutrients spread. Well, the kelp forest functions in a very similar way in the marine ecosystem. Um, that it's that critical, that overstory of the taller kelp, the understory of dozen, many, many species living below provides an ideal habitat for dozens and dozens of animals from very small little critters like amphipods, those cute little bugs, all the way up to killer, up to orca. Um, but many fish are in there. So there, it's, a, it's, a, it's a safe harbor. It's a nursery ground. It's an area where there's tons and tons of food. And they've done studies where they look at animals, marine animals, and just like the forests are sort of made of salmon nutrients, many plants and, and many animals in the area are basically made of kelp nutrients, kelp derived nutrients. So it, it's critical, critical to our ecosystem. And as you said, unfortunately, in the sound, particularly the South Sound, many areas, it's, it's suffered over the last many years um, like through the classic stories, habitat loss, warming temperatures. Um, but fortunately, there are groups looking at restoration of the, of the kelp. And we're, again, we're developing better understanding of the ecology and therefore figuring out better ways to be better managers of the kelp. Great. Yeah, it's a fascinating intertwined story of, um, of humans and, and all the ecological interactions around kelp. It's pretty amazing. I remember tons more kelp when I, just when I was a girl here, using it to whip my friends on the beach. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? um, and uh, yeah, it, I, I, had a, um, I had a moment when my son and daughter first saw a kelp frond and they, they were maybe five and eight. And I, it, it, it kind of drove it home how, how little kelp we have now because I, as a, as a child, I already had seen so much kelp by the time I was five or eight. Right, yeah. So, and they, had, they were seeing it for the first time, wondering what it was. It was interesting. Wow. So yeah. that's one way to kind of measure that change, you know. Um, so um, let's see. Um, let's, talk to, let's talk about connections to place for a bit. And, and this is one theme of your book that I really like, and it really resonates that importance of connection to place. And one of the things you say in the chapter, Birth of a Name, is you say place names constantly change to reflect how different people relate to the land. And so I was wondering if you could describe a bit how different names can carry different ways of relating to the land. Yeah, I mean, I think that one good way is just to look at the name Puget Sound. You know, what's, what is the story of Puget Sound? And the story, if those who don't know it, um, George Vancouver sails into this body of water in May of 1792, becomes the first known European to come down the waterway. He anchors off of uh, Bainbridge Island which he does not name. Um, and he sends his Lieutenant Peter Puget south 
to spend about a week exploring in the, the area to the south. And when Puget returns to the boat, um, Vancouver writes in his journal, to honor his exertions, I named this place Puget's Sound. And a couple aspects of that story. One is that Puget Sound, what the, the sort of first designation really was the area south of Seattle, and, and you might even argue south of Tacoma. And more, in addition, is the term he uses, he doesn't call it Puget Sound, he calls it Puget's Sound, with that apostrophe S, that, that sense of possession. And they have named, a, they name another area, Possession Sound, on the day that we took possession of this body of water. It's the Strait of Georgia. It was basically Georgia Strait. So many of these British, early British names are names of possession, of ownership, based on basically no connection to place. Compare that with the indigenous names. The oldest name we have for this waterway is, is I'm going to mispronounce it because I'm horrible with names, is Hwalj, which means of the salt or the salt in the sense that the people who used that term were not necessarily thinking from a cartographic point of view, but more from a relationship point of view. We are of the salt. We are the, our world is formed by our relationship to the salt. And in fact, they could consider people who lived in areas up in the freshwater to be of lower breeding and, and an ethnographer. One of my favorite stories was an ethnographer who was talking to people in the area and they said, oh, if you wanted to sort of talk to someone, refer to someone of low breeding, you would say like that, yon, that person from yonder, Issaquah. So just to me, I thought that was, I love that idea of, of your world, the landscape that you, the term you use is based on your relationship with place. And if you look at the Lachute seed names on the landscape, of which fortunately we have, we know many, there obviously have been lost over time through the European names that have been placed on the land. So many of them, in fact, all of them are about relationship, about here's a good place to find food. Here's a, a place where you could move your canoe through at low tide. It was all based on getting back to what we said very, I said very early on. It was based on observation. It was based on connection. And we don't see that with later names. Um, there's that part of the story. And then there's just the part of the story to understand to me, which I think is fascinating, is to understand that relationship between those, the, the Europeans who came and, and the names that they left on the land. And Captain Wilkes, who arrives here in the US um, exploring expedition in 1841, named something that leaves like 200 plus names on the land. Bainbridge Island was one of his names. Um, go to the north part of the sound and there's, there are many Spanish names. You know, think of the San Juan Islands, Lopez Island, Harrow Strait. That's because the first Europeans to come down the Strait of Juan de Fuca were Spanish, but we don't get that story. But look at the names on the land and we see it. We then see it with names from Hudson's Bay Company. When they're, they move into the area, some of their names are left on the land. So to me, looking at those names, they're all about story and they're all about connection. Some based on very deep connection, some based on a, a, a feeling of ownership, some based on we just feel like we need to put a name on the land because it helps people understand uh, pointing like, oh, that's that hill. No, that hill is called X hill. Um, so to me, it, I just think it's a great way to, to be yet another way, I guess, to, um, to think about stories of place. Mm -hmm. That's great. And it, it's interesting when you were talking about Puget Sound used to be a smaller, you know, part of the sound and then expanded. And now and now we all now we're, we're conceptualizing this thing called the Salish Sea. Um, and that, that's kind of interesting to me to see how our understanding of this inland waterway is um, kind of, of changing over time, you know, from, from this small part of Puget Sound to the Washington part to this trans international boundary that, um, that we recognize that a lot of the, the species use in the sailor. Yeah, Bianca, I think that's a, that's a great point that that's really, I, and I think it, to me, it reflects that choice of, of 
Salish Sea reflects a, a really important theme in the book for me is the idea of how European settlement has changed here. And if you look at, and Herring exemplifies this story is that when, when Europeans first move into this area, I think they really saw it as a place to exploit. Um, the natural resources here were seemingly limitless and they really were if we only had 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 people when you've got millions, it, aren't, it isn't that way, but they come in herring, Olympia oyster, salmon, trees, coal, everything is, is to be um, used and exploited. But over time, and I would say in the last couple decades, what we've seen is really a fundamental change from that idea of exploitation to an idea of stewardship and sustainability. And I think your example of the Salish Sea is a perfect one, that that name which has come, has been developed to refer to Puget Sound, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and the Strait of Georgia as one continuous linked body of water, linked by water, linked by land, linked by people, linked by animals, and linked by plants, that if we look at it from that point of view, it gives us impetus, I think, to, be, to, to realize that all that we do plays into all that happens around us. And to me, that makes it incumbent upon us to be better citizens of this place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you were talking there, you were, and you were talking about um, you know, the population and, and how we had so, much, so many resources um, and that we're struggling with the sustainability now. There's, you know, there's a lot of tension that exists between commercial interests, recreational interests, tribal fisheries, wildlife demands. And um, it popped into my head that in the book, you, you um, talked about the Salish people having strict cultural values that set them apart from um, other cultures at the time. And then, and then also into the present day um, where um, there was a lot of, um, understanding about how to live sustainably. And, and what, what really surprised me in the book is that um, you cited a study that said, um, that showed that pre-European populations were large enough that they probably could have wiped out salmon populations, um, but they didn't. And, and so I'm, I'm kind of wondering, are there any sort of, um, species management tools that, that, that indigenous people have used throughout time that, that we can start applying or that would help in, in our situation today? Yeah, God, man, many um, that, I, that, that are out there. I mean, I think one as we, I talked about earlier is it's just having respect for these species. I mean, I, I think the, I, I have to say I'd sort of long sort of not understood the importance of the first salmon ceremony. And that if you have such deep respect and deep uh, connection to that first salmon and, and realize the importance and the, the beauty and the grace of that animal returning and you, and you sort of put all of it into that one salmon, to me, what it's going to do is you're going to want to continue that and you want, and, and knowing that the way to have that animal return is to not over harvest, it's not to exploit to be respectful of that animal um, as a species and as part of that waterway that you are part of. Um, so there's, there's that aspect of it. Just, just to me, is it, it really, in reading more about it, just realized the, be the beauty of that ceremony that uh, by offering your, your gratitude and being humble before that animal, to me, is just a, a great way to be, to have that sustainability just sort of built into what you do. Mm -hmm. But also then adapting when things change and not continuing to exploit. When you see the numbers dropping, then you change and, and, and act in a different manner. Um, and always realizing that there are certain animals that you don't want to take. I mean, part of the problem that we've seen with a number of species in the sound and elsewhere um, is taking the largest ones. And when you take the largest ones, then you're often taking the ones that are most um, fecund, are the ones that produce the most. And it's like, well, 
maybe you shouldn't take the ones that are that way because they're reproducing. So that to me is a lesson. And we're seeing that. Um, I was just talking to someone about rockfish, which is one of the groups of animals I talk about. And you see that the, they're now realizing that there are certain, often a handful of the, the bigger animals are the ones that are disproportionately providing more offspring. We see that with rockfish, we see that with herring. And so managers are starting to think that way. Okay, let's not take these big animals because they're the ones who are sort of have an oversight over, um, have a bigger proportion of contribution to the health of that uh, group of animals and then hence to the health of the ecosystem. So those are, I think, just some of the ideas that I think are come about sort of with that, as people look at how Coast Salish people hunted and fished, that those lessons are now being learned, having to be learned again, even though they've been part of the waterway for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes. Um, so I'm going to ask you maybe one or maybe two more questions, and then we'll open it up for, um, for questions from the audience. So everybody get your questions ready. Um, and start putting them in the chat and we can we can pick from them in, in a minute or two here. Um, so uh, I wanted to touch on briefly um, shorelines since we're an island and that makes up so much of our identity. <laughs> we now are. you tell me. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Vashon has 51 miles of shoreline and half of the undeveloped shoreline in King County is on Vashon. So our, our shorelines are, are regionally very, very important for salmon, for the little fish you're calling, you know, the forage fish, herring, yep. surf smelt, sand lance that underpin that food chain. Um, and, and they form a strong part of our community identity. That's, those were the areas of the island that were settled first before pre, uh, Europeans, uh, Euro-Asians uh, and American settles, settlers came. And then also when, when that, um, the Euro-American settlers came, those were the first um, areas they used on the island as well. So we have a long, uh, long connection to those shorelines. Um, and uh, I guess my question is, you um, in your book, you talk a lot about, you know, the importance, well, you talk a little bit about the importance of shorelines in the, the food web and um, also uh, short, you, you mentioned a shoreline restoration project that happened at Seahurst Park over in Burien. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and you, you talk also about the Elwha Dam, which, um, which is a really great restoration success story. Um, but a lot of the success stories that we're hearing about are on, on public lands. And, um, and, and, and I'm wondering if there is a, you know, kind of what is the role of private lands? Because on Vashon, a lot of our shorelines, our tidelands are private, our forests are private, and, and throughout the Puget Sound, really, what's the role of, of, of the private citizen and can can they <clears throat> somehow um, help with this restoration? Yeah, that's yeah. A, I mean the shoreline was is as you say it's so critical. I mean it's what I think the sound has something like fourteen hundred miles of total shoreline, um, and yeah, the idea of the importance whether it is the bluffs eroding and providing sand down into that ecosystem which is important for the salmon and as you say important for the forage fish and in talking to people about it i mean I, i've been interested by the fact that there's been more and more of this focus on in on private landowners because they're the ones who were you know initially a lot of that change that occurred the armoring of the shoreline was really due to sort of bigger entities. It was the railroad running it. It was uh, air, cities developing their peer system. That's, that's changing. But then in the last 30 plus, 40 plus years, we've seen a lot of change with, with private owners changing to putting armoring in. And all the work that's been done over the last handful of years shows that if we can remove armoring, that it just has a huge positive impact that particularly when people start to work together and, sh and they start to, to spread out and, and remove that armoring along their shoreline, connect with their neighbors who are removing it, it creates habitat that's more resilient, better adapted to rising sea levels, better for uh, the ecosystem. So there's many advantages 
to it. And you also just get a better beach. Um, armoring just has so many negative effects in terms of how it alters, how waves form, how waves move through an ecosystem, the erosion can lead to increased erosion because of it. It alters the sand that's along the shoreline. I mean, there's, there's I think it's, it, again, it, it gets back to, I guess, um, Bianca, to me is what is your own, what is one's own relationship to place? We are all part of the story here. We all can contribute. We can all work to make this a better ecosystem. And it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take all each of us making that change and recognizing that all of our actions add up, all of our actions make a difference um, on the landscape. And so for me, that's a reason to think as a, if one, if, as a private landowner, I'm part of the story here. And part of the story is developing and re respecting what's going on around you. Great. Well, that leads me to my very, very last question. Then I'll let other people take it take a shot. <laughs> okay. Um, and you, you end your book with a, a real, really a message of hope that it's, that it's fairly simple, that we just have to change this relationship with the earth so that we are, we are, we have this sense of place and this, and this, this love for our home um, and a sensitivity to the needs of, of nature around us. And, and that really resonated a lot of us at VNC talked about your book together and it really resonated with us because our our vision is a world awakened to the wonders of nature and we we try to create those connective moments where people mm. are able to steward lands together as part of community and 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 culture here on the island and but really after many years of doing this we have to be truthful that sometimes it just seems like a drop in the bucket you know when you look at the um the, the, the power of, of this global extractive culture and, and all of the, um, you know, like all of the globally interconnected um, things that are happening to, um, and so yeah. I, it just seems like a, a huge hill to climb sometimes. And I'm just wondering um, what is your advice or thinking and, and why, why is it that you remain hopeful? Like what, what do you hold on to there? I have se several several points, and I certainly respect and understand where you're what you're saying, and and I think it's we all face that. And I guess my hope comes from a a, a couple of things. Uh, one, as I said, is I think this this changing relationship to place that's occurred in the sound over the last few decades. To me, that is hope. Being out with scientists, who again, what I you know the points I've made about the better understanding of the life histories of these organisms. Um, you know, for example, rockfish. We have 27 species in the sound. Two of them are on the threatened and endangered list. But, it, it, but the reason they got to that point is we didn't understand their life history. We didn't understand how these animals lived in a place. And as we've gotten that better understanding, our management has approved and we're seeing those animals come back. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I end, ending the book with salmon and orca, what really stood out for me was this idea of, again, the life histories, but also how have these animals adapted to this place? They've lived here for the basically the last 15, 16,000 years since the ice retreated back far enough to allow salt water to come in. And they've evolved and adapted specifically and, and the sort of the language I've been using of late is that really this place runs in the DNA of their bodies in, in, in within them and I think if our goal is to give them that opportunity to um, show the resiliency that they have adapted and, and you brought up the Elwha Dam and one of the things about the Elwha Dam that that a biologist said to me that really sh struck me as a positive sign, I guess, is that he said, you know, the salmon went back almost immediately up the Elwha River. And the reason he said, part of the reason is that they've been doing that for thousands of years. They have battled ice before, they've battled barriers before. And by having that sort of DNA in their veins, they have that built-in resiliency. And if we can just give them the opportunity. And I think people are turning in that direction. I think through organizations like yours, where you're that that you all you know probably much better than I do that that profound experience that someone has when they 
see a tide change when they get to hold an animal they understand when they begin to understand that ecosystem to me is really incredible um, and then I guess the final thought on that is I was talking to someone about climate a couple of people about climate change of, of late I've been thinking about and one of them works for the climate impacts group at the University of Washington and, and she said my friends asked me, aren't you sort of, don't you get bummed out? It doesn't it just depress you working on climate change? I said, no, because I know that I'm working and seeing others work toward a solution. And so again, it gets back to that hope from being, drawing inspiration from the animals, but also drawing inspiration and hope from people around us who are also working for the positive, working for, the good. And then the, the final point along that is it sort of to me sort of connects is I, what this idea that we often hear, as you say, what we do is a drop in the bucket, that we as individuals are so small compared to the, the big story. But uh, there's someone else I heard say, she said, I decided to turn that phrase around and say, everything I do makes a difference. And I thought that was a really, again, a profound way to see the world of trying to think, but what I do can help. What I do can connect people. What I do by developing the better relationships, developing the better connections, ultimately can help to contribute to making it a better world. And if I don't hold that attitude, then I just think, why? Why would you care? And I mean, we're so blessed here with this incredible, incredibly beautiful place with incredible diversity. I, I just have, I draw hope from that too. There's just many things and, and maybe it's just my nature, but I, it's the way I want to see the world. Yeah. Oh, that's very powerful. I'm glad this is recorded because that was a good speech. <laughs> very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. <laughs> now, I've hogged a lot of the time, but um, I'm going to introduce Maria. If you want to come on, hopefully you've been kind of monitoring the chat because I've been really focusing on this. Do you, do you want to pick a few questions to start out? This is Maria. Yes. Hi. Um, hey, Maria. Hi, David. Bianca, that was an excellent conversation. So it was um, engrossing. Uh, there was a couple great questions in the chat that I noticed. Um, Bianca, I thought maybe you could address this first one that came up mm -hmm. about herring and the fact that you mentioned there was no herring spawn. And we bring that up in the exhibit as well, even though we do know that some locals have seen that. So could you kind of explain that? And then related to that, um, someone was asking about what the cause of losing our kelp beds is and what we could do about that. So I thought what, either one of you could take that. Yeah, great. Yeah, what I was referring to is the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife surveys that are done every single year for spawning, um, and they didn't find any. It doesn't mean that any none happened at all. Um, it just means that um, in relation to the um, the long term record, we're pretty pretty far down <laughs> on the record. And and I don't know. I never. I didn't hear whether people saw um, just the herring or whether they saw the eggs. Um, this actual spawn on the eelgrass, but that would be something that would be great to know. Um, yeah. And if you've never seen a spawning event, it is an amazing thing to see. I mean, it's, 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 everybody comes to it and particularly um, where I've seen it in the sound and you see the surf scoters, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of birds just on the surface because there are thousands of fish underneath their eggs are down there, they're going and they're just, they're just having at it and go along the shoreline, as you said, Bianca, and see that. And the place where it's, uh, you know, sadly, as you say, Quartermaster is not doing as well. But if you go into Hood Canal, you'll, the herring popul herring there seem to be doing better than they've done for quite a while. So there's a real positive uh, feel about herring there. Um, so in spring, once starting in January, when the, the spawnings event, Start, spawning start if you have a chance to see it definitely try and seek it out it's really incredible do you want to take the kelp question david do you remember it 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, the whole aspect of, of kelp being lost here, it's a, it's a couple of aspects and, and part of it, they're trying to understand that better, but um, loss of uh, you know, increased sedimentation coming into the sound that kelp rely on um, hard substrate. So when you cover up hard substrate, that that's a problem. Um, the other aspect of it is with with warming temperatures we're seeing some issues where they're not kelp is not able to reproduce as well um, in the sound and and throughout other areas we don't have a problem here as much with the loss of kelp due to the increase in urchin populations but you may have read there's a story in the new york times recently about the increase in in the urchin population primarily because of the loss of sea otters and sea otters are great at eating urchins and when sea otters are gone, the urchin population explodes and they and urchins can act basically as, as clear cutters and totally decimate the, the kelp forest. So it's, it's less of a problem here, more out in the, in the strait and in other parts. In terms of restoration, they're, start, they're just starting work on that to try and figure out how to do that well. Um, there, there's been some work done, the Puget Sound Restoration Fund, uh, particularly up in Hood Canal, um, they're doing that. And part of the reason they're looking at better understanding how to, to sort of help propagate kelp is because of kelp helping with um, ocean acidification, this idea that the waters as they become warmer are becoming more acidified. And kelp has a tendency to take up that carbon that would go towards increased acidification. So there's, there's been some initial work on trying to better understand that, the ways to, to to restore kelp beds. And it will always be a very localized phenomenon, but you can have a great effect in that little local area that's very important. Mm -hmm. okay. You're uh, muted. There, there, there is one back. other question about, um, someone was asking about books. And so we, I just wanted to remind everyone that the Vashon Bookshop does have David's book um, in stock right now, and it can be ordered there. Um, and then Susie it's was be a wondering, mad rush, David. What? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's going to be a mad rush after this. It's talk. a mad rush. <laughs> and I'll also just put in a, a quick uh, plug for myself because I'm, you know, I'm all about me. Um, is if you're interested in getting a signed copy, you can get them through my website, um, geologywriter.com. I have a, a link in there to buy them. Um, as well, if 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 the Vashon bookstore runs out and and we want to avoid a, a large company named after a large river, <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, well, I I think we're about out of time here, aren't we, Elsa? Yeah, we'll see what Elsa's in charge. Elsa's in charge. She is. We're trying to respect the time limit. <laughs> there, there was a question about the relationship between indigenous people and herring. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, one of the things, the study that was done, we were talking a little bit about it in regard to Vaishan, is that uh, when archaeological work was done looking at herring um, throughout time over the last 10 or 12,000 years, herring are just as ubiquitous and just as abundant in archaeological sites throughout the region. So they're probably just as important to, to the Coast Salish people as salmon, um, particularly coming at different times of year, but very, very important uh, part of the whole, the whole Coast Salish world. Thank you. Thank you, David, for being here with us tonight. Um, this has just been fascinating. Um, I do have a copy of your book, so if anybody wants to pay double, they can call me and I'll a perfect Christmas present. Um, it was a great read, and I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Bianca and Maria, for managing this chat and the interview. And um, I want to do, do a plug for, of course, um, November 5th is when we'll be opening Wild Wonder, Natural Wonder. And um, <laughs> thank you, Chris. <laughs> and we're pretty excited uh, about that. That's this has been two years in the making. And um, with that, I'm just going to say good night and thank you to everybody.
Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Thanks, David. Great Thanks, talking Bianca. to you. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Elsa, Chris. Good night. Maria. Good night, everybody. Good night.